Hello, I'm continuing my reviews on the Godzilla series with The Return of Godzilla. Now, The Return of Godzilla came out in 1984 in Japan. Now, a year later, there was a heavily re-edited English version of this film released in the U.S. as Godzilla 1985. And kind of like what they did with the original Godzilla, when they brought it over to America, they basically made it a different movie. Now, I have a lot of nostalgia for the American version of this film, Godzilla 1985, but I'll save my thoughts on Godzilla 1985 for the second half of this video. Now, The Return of Godzilla is the 16th film in the Godzilla franchise, but the film acts as a reboot to the franchise, as well as a direct sequel to the original Godzilla, ignoring the continuity of all the films in between. So basically, in this movie's timeline, only the events of the original 1954 film have happened. This movie basically did what the most recent Halloween movie did. Now, the original Godzilla was a very serious film and was an intensely political film, making a statement on the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II, as well as on the dangers of nuclear testing. But the original film spawned an ongoing series of sequels, and as the sequels went on, they got progressively goofier and goofier until the 1970s, where the series was being made exclusively for children, and Godzilla became an outright superhero. Now, what producer Tomoki Tunaka admitted that gearing the series towards children was a mistake, so he wanted to return the series to its darker roots, not just making Godzilla scary again, but also delivering a more adult-oriented and politically charged Godzilla movie. And The Return of Godzilla is a very political film. The film is very much making a commentary on the tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, which were kind of at their peak in the 1980s, and the film is also about Japan's place in that conflict, being between these two superpowers. Now, in the 1980s, there was a lot of paranoia about the possibility of World War III breaking out between the United States and the Soviet Union, and this paranoia was definitely reflected in a lot of fiction at the time. Movies like The Day After, or Threads, or Miracle Mile, or even Red Dawn, or books like Alan Moore's Watchmen, or Robert McCammon's Swan Song. And The Return of Godzilla very much fits in with all that, where Godzilla is once again an allegory for the threat of nuclear annihilation, but the film is also making a commentary on the implications of nuclear energy. I believe Tomoki Tunaka did say that he was inspired to return Godzilla to his darker roots after the Three Mile Island nuclear meltdown. Now, what Tomoki Tunaka actually offered Shiro Honda, the man who directed the original Godzilla and directed several of the Godzilla sequels, the chance to direct this movie, but at the time, Shiro Honda was helping his friend Akira Kurosawa with many of his films in the 1980s. But I also think Ashiro Honda probably wouldn't have done it regardless, because even by the time he directed Terror of Mecha Godzilla, he was already getting very burnt out on the giant monster genre. But I also think Honda didn't want to do it because he didn't think it was right to do more Godzilla movies after the death of Eiji Tsuburaya. But the movie ended up being directed by Koji Hashimoto. I probably butchered that name. Now, besides this, he only directed one other movie, and that was 1984's Sayonara Jupiter. But he did work as an assistant director on many of the earlier Godzilla films. Now, I absolutely love The Return of Godzilla. Honestly, I think this might actually be the best of the Godzilla sequels, because of all the Godzilla movies, this is the one that comes the closest to matching the tone and the feel of the original film, where it's very much a horror film and a political drama. Now, what the plot of The Return of Godzilla is it's set 30 years after the events of the original film, where a giant prehistoric creature dubbed Godzilla was awoken and mutated by nuclear testing, and then this creature attacked the city of Tokyo, Japan, completely devastating the city, but eventually the creature was destroyed. But now it's 30 years later, and it appears that a new Godzilla has emerged. Now, at first, the Japanese government is trying to keep the creature's existence a secret from the public, because they know that the news of this would probably plunge the country into chaos. 
But eventually in the movie, Godzilla attacks and destroys a Russian nuclear submarine, and now the Russians believe that it was the Americans who did this, so now it appears that World War III is imminent. So, in order to avert a nuclear war, the Japanese government has no choice but to reveal Godzilla's existence to the public. So, the film mostly focuses on how the world, but primarily Japan, reacts to Godzilla's return. Now, the film primarily follows a scientist named Professor Hayashida, a young fisherman, and his sister, both of whom are students of Hayashida, as well as a journalist, as well as members of the Japanese government in their efforts in stopping this creature before history repeats itself. Now, the human characters in The Return of Godzilla are certainly not as deep or complex as the characters in, say, the original film, but they're still likable and sympathetic. You have Professor Hayashida, who's a very interesting character. You find out that his parents were killed during the events of the 1954 film, and it seems like he should hate Godzilla, but you realize that he actually does feel some sympathy for this creature, realizing that the creature really is just a victim of the bomb. Now, Hayashima is played by... Yasuko Natsuki, I probably butchered his name, but he actually played one of the main characters in Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster. Now, this character was originally going to be played by Akihito Hirata, who played Dr. Sarazawa in the original film and played different characters in several of the Godzilla sequels prior to this. Now, that would have been awesome if Hirata could have come back for this movie, but unfortunately he died of lung cancer shortly before the production of this film. Now, in the movie, you have the character of Goro Maki, played by Ken Tanaka, who starts off the movie as kind of a jackass, where he reunites this guy with his sister, and at first it seems like he's doing this for virtuistic reasons, but you realize he's only doing this because it would make a great story. But as it goes on, he does develop into a better character. Shin Takuma also does a really good job as Hiroshi, the only survivor of Godzilla's first attack in the movie. Yosuka Saguchi, and yes, I know I'm probably butchering most of the Japanese names in this video, which I do apologize for, but she does a really good job in this movie as Hiroshi's sister. But there is a romance between her and Maki that I will say is a little forced in the film. Hiroshi Kozumi also has a small role in this movie, and I barely even recognized him in the film. But it's really cool seeing him in this movie, because he was in several of the other Godzilla films prior to this, so it's almost like a connection between this and the original series. But in my opinion, the most compelling character in this movie is the Prime Minister of Japan, played by Kenju Kobayashi. And it was really interesting having a politician as the main character of a Godzilla movie. That's something that you didn't really see in too many of the Godzilla films prior to this. And you really do feel bad for this guy having to make these difficult decisions that could decide the fate of his entire country. And when the Japanese government first finds out about this new Godzilla, you could tell that he was not expecting this at all. And there's a really powerful scene in this movie involving this character where an ambassador from America and an ambassador from Russia are pressuring him to let them use atomic weapons on Japanese soil in order to destroy Godzilla, and he has to stand firmly against this. And the American ambassador even says at one point, this is no time to be discussing principles, and he says, no, this is exactly the time to be discussing principles, and he stands against them trying to use nuclear weapons on Japan, knowing that Japan has suffered so much because of nuclear weapons. And there's a moment after this meeting where he says what finally convinced them not to use nuclear weapons is he said, if Godzilla were attacking Washington, or if Godzilla Godzilla were attacking Moscow, would you use nuclear weapons knowing that so many of your people would be killed? And once again, the Prime Minister is easily the best human character in the film. Now, even though this movie is very much about the Cold War tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, I like how the movie doesn't really pick a side in that conflict. Rather, it's calling both sides out, and also showing the pros and cons of both sides. I can't necessarily say the same about the American version 
version of this film, but I'll get to that. And the movie does a really good job at portraying Godzilla realistically, where it's like, okay, if a creature like this really did appear, how would that affect the economy? How would that affect international relations? And I gotta say that most of Teriyoshi Nakano's special effects in this movie still hold up today, and I would say is right on par with American films that were coming out at the time. I say most because there are some shots of Godzilla's feet coming down which don't look the best. Also, there's a scene in the beginning of the movie involving a giant sea louse. Basically, this was a sea louse that was feeding on Godzilla's blood and the radiation from Godzilla's blood mutated it. And I would say for the most part, the sea louse looks really good. But there's one shot in the movie where it doesn't look very good. Like, it clearly looks like a puppet. But besides that, I would say most of the special effects in this movie is very good. This is also one of the most well-shot Godzilla movies that I could think of. Like, there's this beautiful shot in the movie after Godzilla destroys a train of his reflection on a building, and it's just so visually interesting. And I also gotta say, I do really love Godzilla's look in the movie, and the movie does a really good job at returning Godzilla to the sense of awe and horror that he inspired in the original film. I also gotta say, I love the music in this movie. The music in this film was done by Raihiro Koryoku, and yes, I know I'm probably saying that wrong, but the music in this film, it does a really good job at portraying the sense of horror and awe that Godzilla inspires, but it also has kind of a John Williams-esque kind of feel to it, which adds to the film, because the film does have an almost Spielbergian quality to it. But once again, I absolutely love of the return of Godzilla. I don't necessarily think it's a flawless movie, but I do think this is probably the best Godzilla movie since the original film. Now, for the longest time, you couldn't officially get this movie here in the States. This DVD that I have, I actually got from a convention several years ago. However, the film was released in 2016 on DVD and Blu-ray from Kraken Releasing. Now, as I mentioned before, there is the American cut of this film, Godzilla 1985, which I don't think is as good as the original Japanese version, but I will say there are little things that the American cut actually improved upon. But I'll talk more about the American cut of this film after I cut to two short reviews on this film done by my friends Jeremy and John, and where the fuck did that Dr. Pepper come from? Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. So, I just watched the Japanese film, The Return of Godzilla, and I'm going to do a review on it for my friend Christian's series of reviews on the Godzilla series. All in all, I thought that this was a good, entertaining entry in the series, and it makes, the God, it makes Godzilla the villain again and returns the series back to its darker roots. There's a lot of discussion amongst the characters about the effects of nuclear weapons, and it also makes a point of reaffirming the fact that Godzilla was a product of nuclear destruction. The scenes with Godzilla are very entertaining to watch, and he definitely gets to cause a good amount of destruction, I also like the scene at the beginning with the giant sea louse. That thing was really creepy. Well, that wraps up my review of The Return of Godzilla. The Return of Godzilla is probably one of the uh, best Godzilla films I've seen in the series thus far. What I like about this film is that it goes back to its uh, original dark roots rather than being made for comedy and laughs and cheesy, unlike the original sequels that were made as uh, cheesy sci-fi B-movies. The special effects in this film were definitely an improvement and getting much better because even the first film, the effects had its like moments of like good quality and bad quality effects where in the sequels, the effects weren't the best quality, but this definitely was a huge improvement on the effects and had better quality. I also like love the characters. I found them very interesting, very engaging, and definitely invested in these characters. The film also does a great job of showing about like how in the 80s, how heavy the Cold War was at that time, of not knowing whether 
we were going to get into war with Russia, or if Russia was going to attack us, etc. And I hope you enjoyed Jeremy and John's short reviews on the return of Godzilla. Now onto my thoughts on the American cut, Godzilla 1985. Now, this version of the film was put out by New World Pictures, which was a company started by Roger Corman, and they put out movies like Children of the Corn, Creepshow 2, and Hellraiser. They were a relatively big name for horror in the 1980s. Now, this American version of the film was produced by Tony Rendell, credited as Anthony Rendell, who would go on to direct movies like Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, and Ticks, and Animeville 1992. It it's about time. But New World didn't just release an English dub of the film. What they did was they drastically re-edited the film. Like, they cut out a lot of scenes, or they switched scenes around, and they also added additional scenes not in the original Japanese version. A similar thing happened with the original Godzilla. When the original 1954 film came over to America in 1956, it was also drastically re-edited and featured additional scenes, and it was re titled Godzilla King of the Monsters. And the Americanized version of the original Godzilla also featured additional scenes featuring a character named Steve Martin, played by Raymond Burr. And much like what they did with the original Godzilla, Godzilla 1985 also has additional scenes of Raymond Burr reprising his role as Steve Martin. However, in the movie they call him Mr. Martin, as to avoid confusion with the actor Steve Martin, who was gaining popularity at the time. And the additional American footage was directed by R.J. Kaiser. Now, I mentioned in my review of Terror of Mecha Godzilla that that was the only Godzilla movie written by a woman, but that's not entirely true because the English script for Godzilla 1985 was written by a woman named Lisa Tomei. Now, I have Godzilla 1985 on VHS, but this VHS tape has to be close to 30 years old at this point, if not even older, so as you can imagine, the tape is a little worn out at this point, so a few years ago at a convention I got this, uh, <coughs> bootleg um, of Godzilla 1985 just because in case anything happened to the tape, I still wanted to have the actual movie because legally you can only find Godzilla 1985 on VHS now. For legal reasons they're probably never going to release this on official DVD because Godzilla 1985 did use some of Christopher Young's music from a movie called Defcon Four. So, for copyright reasons, we're probably never going to see an official DVD or Blu-ray of Godzilla 1985, which is a damn shame because I could totally see Shout Factory putting this movie out. Or what would be even better is a box set of both this and the original Japanese version. Now, Godzilla 1985 gets a lot of shit, but this movie is always going to have a very special place in my heart because this was actually my second Godzilla movie. When I was a little kid, my grandparents had both this and King Kong vs. Godzilla on VHS, and I would watch these movies all the time when I was over their house. Now, I'll start with the negatives about this version of the film. This version does cut out a lot of key character moments from the original Japanese version. Also, the dubbing of the original Japanese footage is not the best, but that's to be expected. Also, in the newly added American footage, there is some unnecessary comic relief, and also New World Pictures had some kind of deal with Dr. Pepper, so there's a lot of Dr. Pepper product placement in the American scene which is pretty freaking gratuitous, especially one shot of this general dramatically drinking a can of Dr. Pepper. Also, throughout the additional American scenes, Raymond Burr's character has this little figure of a dragon, and it never explains what the hell this is. But perhaps the biggest flaw of this version of the film is how it handles the Cold War stuff. In the original Japanese version, it actually handled the Cold War very maturely, where it wasn't really picked aside. Actually, in the original Japanese version, there was this whole subplot about a Russian nuclear missile accidentally getting launched, and you had this Russian colonel trying to stop the launch before it's too late, but he ends up getting killed. In the American version of this film, they make it look like the Russians intentionally launched that nuke. 
But even though I would say in general The Return of Godzilla is the superior film, there are little things that this version actually improves upon from the original Japanese version. For example, the original Japanese version did have a few editing problems, like there were a few awkward scene transitions in that, whereas this movie actually fixes some of those. Also, this version of the film trims down the sea louse sequence and actually makes it a little more effective by not showing all of the sea louse. But the best thing about this version of the film is by far Raymond Burr. He adds a lot of class to the movie, maybe even more than this version of the film actually deserves. And he has this really powerful speech at the end of the movie that perfectly sums up not just the themes of this movie, but the themes of the original Godzilla as well. Now, Godzilla 1985 did not do very well in the American box office, and it was savaged by the critics, but the film has gondered a cult following. But I love Godzilla 1985, despite its flaws, and despite the fact that the original Japanese version is technically superior, I do think this version is worth a watch, if you could track it down. Now I want to cut to my friends Jeremy and John again, given their thoughts on Godzilla 1985, and will you get out of here? So here's my review of Godzilla 1985. This was an Americanized version of The Return of Godzilla, and also a sequel to Godzilla King of the Monsters. Like its predecessor, it contains a lot of footage from its Japanese counterpart, and edits it together with newly shot footage of Raymond Burr, who reprises his role as Steve Martin. All in all, I thought that this movie was entertaining enough. Also, like its predecessor, it's very easy to tell that a lot of the Japanese actors are dubbed over with English dialogue, although they do a decent job of editing the footage with Raymond Burr into the scenes from the original Japanese version of The Return of Godzilla. So, all in all, I'm uh, giving this one a positive review, and I hope you all continue to do well and stay safe. <sighs> Godzilla 1985, just like uh, with the original Godzilla, I had no idea there were two different versions of this film, that there was the Japanese cut and there was the American cut that was released a year later, 1985, with Raymond Burr coming back. In the first film, he was known as Steve Marr, but at this time, they only call him Mr. Marr because Steve Marr, the comedian, was very popular and famous during this time. This film does it a little bit better than King of the Mods, at least we're like focusing on characters in a good balance from the Japanese cut, and then we're focusing on a good half majority on Raymond Burr's character when he comes into investigative, like, Godzilla, like, later into the movie. Now, with the return of Godzilla, or Godzilla 1985, spawned six sequels, which together with this movie, make up what's now known as the Heisei Godzilla series. Even though this movie came out when Japan was still in its Showa period, because the sequels to this came out in the beginning of Japan's Heisei period, retroactively, this is considered to be the first film of the Heisei Godzilla series. Now, the other Heisei Godzilla films are Godzilla vs. Biollante from 1989, Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah from 1991, Godzilla and Mothra The Battle for Earth from 1992, Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla 2 from 1993, Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla from 1994, and the final film of the Heisei Godzilla series was 1995's Godzilla vs. Destroya. Now, I like the other Heisei Godzilla films, but I do think the Heisei series fell into the same trap as the Showa series. Eventually, they started to get goofy again, and they started to gear the films more towards children once again. Now, I actually think the 2000 2016 Godzilla film Shin Godzilla owes a lot to this movie. I mean, it owes a lot to the original Godzilla, of course, but that movie does focus a lot on how Godzilla's existence affects politics and international relations and economics. And Shin Godzilla, like The Return of Godzilla, comes the closest to matching the tone and themes of the original film. So, that was my review on The Return of Godzilla and Godzilla 1985, and bye.